Hello, I'm Scott Wright, Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic, and today it's my pleasure to speak to you about PCSK9 inhibitors as part of the treatment for patients with elevated blood cholesterol or lipids. PCSK9 inhibitors have been lipid therapies now for a few years. They were discovered sometime after the year 2000, initially in the lab of Helen Hobbs at UT Southwestern in Dallas, when they were looking at a family of individuals who had quite good longevity and freedom from cardiovascular disease. If we fast forward now to late 2020, we understand that PCSK9 itself has emerged as a critical regulatory step in determining and managing plasma LDL cholesterol concentrations. PCSK9 itself is a protein which facilitates the uptake and recycling of the LDL receptor that is on the surface of the liver or on the hepatocytes. Individuals, for example, who were born with a loss of function of PCSK9 have much greater numbers of LDL clearance receptors on their hepatocytes and as a function have very low cholesterol and very low lifetime cardiovascular risks. The next video is one that was developed for a CME program that I have permission to use with you today, which really describes what PCSK9 does in terms of LDL receptor recycling. So let me play this for you, and then I'll walk you through it one more time to help you understand what role PCSK9 plays and why pharmacologic therapies targeting PCSK9 have been so effective at lowering LDL cholesterol. So let's watch the video now. It is responsible for its clearance and catabolism. Hepatocytes express LDL receptors that bind LDL and remove it from the plasma. The LDL-LDL receptor complex is taken up by the hepatocyte in clathrin-coated vesicles. Inside the cell, these vesicles fuse with endosomes, and the acidic environment of the endosomes facilitates the dissociation of the LDL-LDL receptor complex. The LDL receptor cycles back to the cell surface where it binds to additional LDL particles, leading to a further reduction in plasma LDL cholesterol. Free LDL and endosomes are transported to lysosomes and degraded into lipids, free fatty acids, and amino acids. Proprotein convertase subtilisin like kexin type 9, or PCSK9, is a protein that regulates the expression of the LDL receptor in the liver. Hepatocytes produce a precursor of PCSK9 that undergoes self cleavage in the endoplasmic reticulum and ultimately is secreted into plasma as functional PCSK9. Extracellular PCSK9 binds to the LDL receptor on the surface of the hepatocyte and gets internalized with the LDL-LDL receptor complex. Upon dissociation from LDL, the LDL receptor PCSK9 complex is routed to the lysosome for degradation, thereby preventing the cycling of LDL receptors back to the cell surface. Thus, PCSK9 plays a critical role in regulating plasma LDL cholesterol levels by modulating LDL receptor expression on the surface of hepatocytes. There, I think that is a really nice graphic that demonstrates what happens when PCSK9 interacts with LDL. Just to review what we've just observed or watched in the video, the LDL receptor on the surface of the liver cell grabs circulating LDL and plasma and internalizes it into the liver cell where the LDL itself is degraded into free cholesterol, free triglycerides, apoprotein B, and other things. And the concentrations of such LDL inside the hepatocyte then determine how much native cholesterol is synthesized. As part of this process, the LDL receptor, once it releases LDL, is allowed to recirculate surface back to the set surface of the liver where it can continue to grab LDL and bring it inside. PCSK9 is a protein which binds independently to the LDL receptor and when it and LDL and the receptor are internalized into the uh, 
clathrin-coated pits and then into the lysosomes, the presence of the PCSK9 protein prevents the LDL receptor from going back to the surface, and by preventing that, the LDL receptor itself is destroyed. And this is how there's healthy turnover, in a sense, of LDL receptors uh, on the surface of the liver. And we know that PCSK9 is highly expressed in the liver, small intestine, and kidney, as well as in other tissues, such as even the retina of the body. Now, if you have a gain of function of PCSK9, that simply means that you have more effective PCSK9 or more PCSK9, so that by having excess or higher function of PCSK9, you reduce the num ultimately the number of receptors on the surface of the liver so that less LDL is bound from plasma and internalized into the liver, so plasma levels of LDL go up. So gain of function means fewer LDL receptors and higher levels of LDL in plasma. So a gain of function mutation would be associated with higher long-term cardiovascular risks, and that may be a board question that you want to think about. Now, a PCSK9 loss of function means that the PCSK9, for whatever reason, is less able, less effective, less likely to bind to the LDL receptor, and so the natural processing or recycling of the receptor happens so that due to the loss of function, there are more LDL receptors per square centimeter on the liver surface than normally is seen with someone who has normal function of PCSK9. Now, one to 3% of the population have this loss of function, and the loss of function of PCSK9 is associated with very low plasma LDL levels, and it is protective in a sense, for cardiovascular risks. And this is how PCSK9 was discovered. The Hobbs lab in Dallas found patients who had low LDL values, low lifetime risks of cardiovascular disease, and were found to have a loss of function of PCSK9. The therapies to treat PCSK9 today as a surrogate for treating LDL are basically two types. The first are monoclonal antibodies, which bind free or circulating PCSK9, and by binding the PCSK9, they basically create a functional loss of function scenario where there's less PCSK9 free to bind to the LDL receptor. So by binding PCSK9, they prolong the life of the LDL receptor on the hepatocyte and thus lower cholesterol very dramatically. The second strategy is to develop a small interfering RNA therapy called enclisiran, which then interrupts the synthesis of PCSK9 itself and induces basically a loss of presence, not a loss of function, but a loss of presence of PCSK9 and lowers LDL this way. Now, enclisiran is not approved in the United States as of the date of taping of this uh, educational lecture, but has been approved in Europe. Uh, the two monoclonal antibodies, evolocumab and alirocumab, are approved and have very good clinical experience. So to summarize, this is a graph uh, from a recent paper in CERC Research showing the monoclonal antibodies on the right binding the free PCSK9 and thus inducing a loss of function of PCSK9, or enclisiran inhibiting the translation of message RNA of PCSK9 and thus inducing a loss of PCSK9 or much lower plasma levels. Now, enclisiran is a very recently discovered agent. In 2016 or so, I was part of an initial working group at the European Society of Cardiology in London, which began looking at how we could study enclisiran as a potential therapeutic option for patients with uh, dyslipidemia. It's a small interfering RNA, which uses a double-stranded RNA to activate the RISC complex, the body's endogenous way of suppressing message RNA synthesis, and it blocks the translation of message RNA, which typically would produce the PCSK9 protein, and by blocking that translation, it results in much lower levels of synthesized PCSK9. Now, enclisiran is rather interesting because it's been designed with a carbohydrate moiety called Galnec, which makes it specific for a receptor on the liver cell, the acyloglycoprotein receptor, ASGPR receptors on hepatocytes. 
So here's what Enclisiran looks like. You can see that it's a small, double-stranded RNA with a galnac complex at the very end. It harnesses the endogenous natural processes of RNA interference, but it's been modified slightly to make it less immunogenetic, or immuno to cause less immunogenicity, and to make it more durable. And it's exclusively, we believe, as of this date of this taping, to our knowledge, it's exclusively distributed to the liver due to the galnac moiety on it and it thus inhibits the production of the protein PCSK9 in the hepatocyte. So here's an example of this. You can see the galnac binding to the ASGPR receptor at the very top left. It's taken in in a clathrin coated pit, just like the PCSK9 protein is. Uh, the double-stranded RNA then dissociates into its uh, sense and antisense strand, and the galnac complex is carved off, and it is uh, then uh, destroyed. It's, it's catabolized beside the hepatocyte, and the ASGPR receptor is then recycled right back to the surface of the liver. So when the sense and antisense strands are uh, uh, combined, they actually get bound up by the risk complex, the RNA-induced silencing complex that was discovered in the late 90s, and a Nobel Prize, I believe, was awarded for this. The sense strand, which mimics uh, the message RNA for PCSK9, is then separated through the risk complex, and the antisense strand induces the risk complex to then multiply and have more of the antisense strands, and it finds the message RNA circulating inside the cytoplasm for PCSK9, and the, induces the risk complex, the RNA silencing complex, to then chop up the, the message RNA for PCSK9, resulting in no synthesis of the PCSK9 protein. It's a rather clever technique for lowering PCSK9 levels and lowering cholesterol. Well, how effective are these therapies? Let's look at the monoclonals and then enclisiran. Evolocumab and alirocumab both lower LDL cholesterol by 55 to 60 to 63 percent very potent. Enclisiran has been shown to lower LDL cholesterol 50 to 58, but let's say on average 50 to 55. Uh, ApoB is reduced by all three of these uh, in a comparable way. Total cholesterol is reduced comparably between all three agents, and triglycerides are modestly reduced, probably most by alirocumab and least by enclisiran. A lipoprotein A is also reduced very modestly by enclisiran by 20% and a bit more, closer to 30% by the monoclonal antibodies. Here's where they differ. The dosing and administration is rather different. The monoclonal antibodies are typically given as a subcutaneous injection of 140 milligrams every two weeks, or 26 times per year. Now, patients can elect to receive them, uh, evolocumab, for example, as a monthly injection, but they have to take a much larger dose, 420 milligrams, and it takes about five minutes to infuse it subcutaneously. Alirocumab is the same. You dose it either at 75 or 150 milligrams every two weeks, or you can give patients a 300 milligram injection through an infusion device once a month. Enclisiran, on the other hand, is, a, is an injection of 284 milligrams, but given only every six months. It's like a shot every six months, and it works potently and durably, comparably to drugs that are now being given every two weeks. I want to point out for your benefit that uh, this is all an evolving science, right? Evolocumab and alirocumab have been shown to reduce cardiovascular events in large outcome trials recently, uh, Enclisiran continues in its outcome trial. So if you need evidence, hard evidence of effective secondary prevention, Enclisiran does not have that yet, as, but evolocumab and alirocumab do. If you believe, however, the LDL lowering hypothesis largely explains the secondary prevention benefit of any lipid strategy, then Enclisiran should be comparable with regard to secondary prevention, as are the other drugs in this class. Well, what are the indications for usage, at least for the monoclonals, and likely approved indications for usage for enclisiran if approved? Number one, it'll be patients who have familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, for whom a statin or any oral therapy or combination of oral therapies is insufficient to lower LDL enough to reduce cardiovascular risks. The monoclonals have also been approved for patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease who have ele elevated LDL values despite maximally tolerated oral therapies, and that's how Europe also approved enclisiran. 
How do you use these drugs? Well, you need to start with a statin and typically a higher dose, more intense statin, and then add azetamibe. And if you're unable to get your patient's LDL to whatever goal you feel appropriate, then it's reasonable to add a PCSK9 drug. There are a few patients for whom starting with a PCSK9 may be appropriate, such as those with statin intolerance or those who have very high LDL values due to familial homozygous FH. So it's important to remember that you escalate treatment to a PCSK9 drug when the LDL exceeds or is higher than the target or goal that you have set for your patient or their disease progresses despite you having them on maximally tolerated oral lipid lowering therapy. What are the side effects of any of these drugs? Well, typically there are side effects are related to the injections because uh, you're introducing medication through the skin. And so many patients, you know, five, six percent, will complain of a small irritation or injection site reaction. That's typically mild redness uh, or mild tenderness, pruritus or itchiness, and it typically goes away in a few days. And it doesn't necessarily reoccur. It can with these drugs, but doesn't necessarily. Uh, all three of the agents have shown in safety studies no higher risk of any muscle symptoms or abnormal uh, liver enzymes. And generally, it's safe to say these drugs are well tolerated. I think lastly, it's important to point out that these drugs are not inexpensive. In fact, they are expensive. The monoclonals are roughly $5,000 a year for our patients, and they have to be dispensed at a pharmacy, taken home, and the patient self-injects, like they would insulin or a GLP-1 drug. And glycerin's cost, at least in the United States, has not been disclosed. And to my knowledge, in Europe, it hasn't been disclosed either. But it will be administered in a healthcare provider's office twice a year. Uh, and I want to point out again that Inclisiran is approved in Europe, but it has not been approved as of the recording of this uh, conference, but there is a PDUFA from the FDA expected on December 21st, 2020. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview about PCSK9, why it's important in the regulation of lipids, and why treating it is another important alternative to statins or additive therapy to statins to better get your patients at goal and reduce the risks of cardiovascular disease. Thanks very much for your time and attention on this important topic in treating dyslipidemia with the PCSK9 class of agents.